Hello everyone, Paul K. Gabine with the Garland County Library and now also with a haircut. And tonight's program was a book by the Garland County Master Gardeners as part of their virtual Know It to Grow It series. The Master Gardeners have recruited Alex Dykes, Garland County Extension Agent for Horticulture, to present to you tonight about the nuisance wildlife that might wreak havoc in your yard. As always, if anyone thinks of any comments or questions during tonight's presentation and they'd like to ask they'd like me to ask them to the speaker later, uh, please comment them in the chat and I'll be sure to read them off when I join back in. Before we switch over to Alex, I'm gonna first introduce Judy Dare, who is the chairwoman for the Know It to Grow It committee for the Garland County Master Gardeners. She has a little bit she wants to say tonight about tonight's program and the program for next month and the Master Gardeners in general. So, welcome Judy. Hello everybody. Welcome to the first program of the year. The entire Note to Grow It team really thanks you for coming because we've just been stunned at how great this virtual reality lives for us. Last month, Jerry Butler, who talked about the Audubon Society and the Christmas bird count, had over 527 views. So this is really exciting for us to get our message out. Once again, I have my notes because I do get a little nervous doing this, but I'd like to remind you all that all of these programs reside on the Garland County Library Facebook page. So if you can't make something live, you can always go back and watch the program. And you don't have to have a Facebook account to watch these programs. So please join us every month. So last month we gave away door prizes virtually. So we're going to do the same thing this month. When the program is over, Paul will read off the three first names that came up with either a comment or a question. And then he'll read the comment or question. So all you have to do is go to the Garland County Library Circulation Desk to pick up your door prize and they'll be available starting this Thursday. So next month, back by popular demand, Alan Bates, who is our City of Hot Springs Urban Forester, We'll be back to talk about tree pruning and crepe myrtle bark scale, which is really becoming rampant um, in many counties all over Arkansas. And so if you've ever wondered how to prune a tree or why your crepe myrtle is turning black, please join us next month. It's going to be February 25th at 6 o'clock. So I have the pleasure tonight of introducing Alex Dykes. Alex Dykes, as Paul said, is our Garland County extension agent for horticulture so that means all things plants so he's a he's a wealth of knowledge on that his office is at the extension office 236 woodbine and you can take soil samples down there plant samples down there and there's a library of information about horticulture and agriculture so please use that because it's free to us and it's a wonderful wonderful thing to have in our town alex has been uh our um, master gardener advisor, I guess, for the past few years. And he's been especially helpful and a great leader during this COVID situation. So I thank Alex for that. Alex enjoys spending time with his family. He has a, a wife and two girls, one age 20 and one age four. He is a big outdoorsman and is very, very knowledgeable about all things agriculture. So please welcome Alex. Thanks. Thanks so much. We'll see you next month. Oh, uh, now I want to thank uh, uh, Paul and, and Judy for uh, for this time. Um, as part of my part of my job, I'm I'm here to handle issues dealing with uh, gardens, landscapes, yards, etc. Um, I help with uh, plant diagnostics. Uh, soil testing. Um, I'm not a landscape designer, uh, but I can help uh, homeowners um, by uh, suggesting different plants that can work in different sites in their landscape. Um, so a lot of different things that I can help with. And, and uh, if there's anything I can help you out with, uh, just feel free to contact me. At the end of the presentation, I'll uh, give you my uh, contact information and uh, I'll see what I can do to help you out. Uh, as far as for this evening, uh, we're going to look at uh, some nuisance garden wildlife. I get a lot of questions on um, on um, uh, different animals getting in, in different people's uh, 
vegetable gardens, flower beds, uh, things of that sort. So we're going to talk a little bit uh, uh, this evening about what you can do on uh, uh, keeping those animals out. And so first thing about um, uh, wildlife, we, we love wildlife animals. We love to watch them and, and uh, see them, you know, running around. Um, but uh, that, it kind of stops when uh, all of a sudden we notice our, our trees have been chewed up or, or scraped um, and, and our hostas have been nibbled on and, and uh, tulips been deflowered. Our green beans have turned into green stumps. Um, all of a sudden, we, our attic has been invaded uh, by some varmints. Uh, we get tunnels all over the yard. Uh, we notice the bird feeder has been tipped over and the seeds have been devoured. And at that point, then, you know, we have certain choice words for a lot of these wildlife animals. Some different ways that we in, encounter some urban wildlife are through uh, some property damage issues. Uh, we know some, but they'll get into our landscape plantings or even our buildings and structures um, or even do damage to our vehicles. Um, a lot of these wildlife animals can cause uh, health and safety issues. Over the last couple of years here in Arkansas, uh, we've been dealing with uh, cr uh, chronic wasting disease in deer. Um, rabies is something that uh, we hear about every once in a while and uh, we fear of with, with different wildlife animals. Uh, histoplasmosis is, is a disease that can be passed on uh, through, through different animals. Um, deer and vehicle collisions. Uh, some of y'all that are joining us tonight might be from Hot Springs Village. If, if you haven't had a collision uh, with uh, uh, with a deer, then you probably know 12 or 15 people that have because it happens all the time in the village. And uh, last thing there, tick-borne diseases. You know, and we hear about uh, some different ones uh, that pop up from time to time. And uh, so that's another issue that, that uh, health issue that can pop up. So first thing, what, you know, why do we have problems with wildlife? Well, first thing, you know, humans have moved into wildlife habitat. Um, you know, a lot of people want to get outside of the city and and uh, and live a little bit closer to nature. Well, a lot of times at that point, you're moving into um, areas that wildlife consider to be their home as well. Um, perfect example is Hot Springs Village. At, at Hot Springs Village is a wonderful community, and so uh, don't don't you know misunderstand what I'm saying. Um, but 50 years ago, the land where Hot Springs Village is, 50 years ago, that land was was a wild area. Um, and still in the village, we have a lot of areas that are heavily wooded um, that provide a lot of shelter for, for animals. Another reason why we have problems with wildlife is um, we tend to make our backyard a habitat for them, either intentionally or unintentionally. You know, a lot of times we like to have different shade trees in the backyard or, you know, some different privacy areas that, that we do with, uh, with different plantings. And... Uh, you know, a lot of those wildlife, you know, that's what they like too. And last thing, uh, because more wild, wildlife exists now than, than before. Um, you know, especially when we're dealing with, uh, you know, with some large wildlife animals like deer and bear. Um, I was, you know, I remember my grandfather telling me several years ago when, when he was a young boy living in this area, um, it was rare to see... Uh, white-tailed deer or black bear. Was, they were just, they, they'd either been overhunted or, or moved out for whatever reason. And uh, over the last uh, several decades, um, you know, there's been a lot more conservation efforts and those those species have rebounded. Now we see, you know, white-tailed deer all the time. I, you know, just outside my house, you know, it seems like when I drive home late at night, more often than not, I'm going to see deer outside the house. And so we see them all the time. Uh, before we move on a little bit further and start talking about uh, different uh, uh, species that we deal with, I did want to mention a little bit about uh, toxicants and fumigants. Um, these are things that are on the market and uh, that you can, you know, you can go buy right now at uh, different stores. But you do need to know that it is illegal to use poisons except for rats and mice, um, even though these products are sold in the store. Um, kind of the issue is, 
is the state plant board has approved the sale of these items and game and fish that has jurisdiction over wild animals here in the state um you know they they've banned that from being used um you know uh, and that deals with you know they don't want to hit non-target species um uh, next thing over the top uh, over the counter toxicants and fumigants tend to be of limited effectiveness uh, there's not you know really a lot of research that shows that they're you know a, a really a, a good cure for your you know for the solution and last thing there for rats and mice make sure you follow the label directions i tell people all the time when we're dealing with uh, um, insecticides and herbicides um, rodent insides is another one you know make sure you follow the label the label is the law And here are a few of those um, uh, products that you can find in the stores. Matter of fact, I took these pictures about a year ago in, in, in a store here locally. Said so you can find these products, but um, they've not shown to be very effective. And at, on top of that, as I said, they are illegal to use. Certain nuisance wildlife can be taken or trapped year round, and that is um, that is part of the Game of Fish regulations. Um, you can see a list there. It says beaver, coyote, muskrat, nutria, possum, raccoon, squirrel, striped skunk, and other non-game wildlife. Um, as you notice there, you know, one that we might uh, ha get some issues with or white-tailed deer, that's not on that list. Um, you do have to follow the seasons on that. Um, but you can take those. Uh, you can trap them year-round um, or take them by, by other methods as well. Uh, Traps can be used uh, all over Garland County. Um, it can also be used in the city of Hot Springs as well as Hot Springs Village. Um, animal control uh, in both those uh, communities, uh, both say uh, they're okay to use. Um, even Hot, Hot Springs Animal Control will even loan you traps. Um, rent, we'll, they'll rent them out um, if you need them. And so that might be an avenue there if, if you're dealing with some nuisance wildlife. Um, but one thing I will mention, uh, if you have any questions about regulations, uh, make sure you contact the Game and Fish Commission and uh, they can help you out on, on kind of navigating as far as uh, what's right or what you can do and what you can't do. Um, and there's office here in town. They're very, very helpful. I've contacted them several times on different things. Um, but also, if you live in the city of Hot Springs, you might contact um, Animal Control. And same thing for Hot Springs Village. You can talk, contact Animal Control up there if you have any specific questions on ordinances. So first thing we need to do, whenever we see uh, uh, damage from a nuisance wildlife animal, uh, we need to figure out first thing who the culprit is. And uh, that can kind of lead us on the path of, of making sure we're taking care of it correctly. Um, investigate bite or tooth marks on vegetation. Uh, different animals have different uh, bite marks um, that, that they'll leave. Compare the height of the damage to the size and mobility of the species. All right, if it's something that's, uh, you know, three or four foot high, it probably didn't occur from a, uh, uh, didn't, probably didn't occur from a, from a groundhog or a gopher. Look for tracks and uh, and scat, which is also called you know another word for manure. Um, a lot of times, if if you can't really find tracks, um, one thing that that can be done is you can use um, uh, flour and kind of scatter it around where you're seeing the damage at, and kind of help you out. And because a lot of times they'll leave that track behind with the flour. And then what plants were damaged. Different animals will go after different plants. Um, also the pattern of the damage is another thing. Uh, you can see the picture there on the screen. Uh, you got a Nandina there that uh, was uh, cut down by, by a gopher. They were chewing on it and, and, uh, and were able to uh, tear that plant up. First uh, species we're going to look at are, are uh, white-tailed deer. Now, a lot of us might uh, enjoy watching white-tailed deer, uh, but a lot of times that we, they might, we might want to watch them, but uh, not necessarily be in our yard all the time. They can cause a lot of damage. 
I can see a deer here that's uh, taking use of its surroundings and using a bird bath uh, to get a, a nice, nice drink. Here's something that you might not want to see as much of. You might tolerate the bird bath getting drinked out, of, you know, you know, the deer getting drink out of the bird bath, but you might not tolerate them being in your flower bed. They're taking a look at those roses, and and uh, they see roses as a pretty, pretty good snack, as well as uh, hostas and a few other things. With with deer, uh, we, you know. A lot of people encourage deer to come into their into their yards or you know in, in around their homes, and by putting out uh, salt block, mineral block, um, or deer feeders, and because uh, they like to watch the deer and and uh, think they're helping them out some, and uh, you know that's okay, but you might be the next door neighbor and might have a, a good vegetable garden or flower bed, and uh, they decide to uh, diversify their diet and and. Uh, and decide to uh, eat a little bit on what you have as well. And so that can be kind of a nuisance. The tracks of deer are pretty easy to identify. Uh, you've probably seen them before. Um, they got uh, uh, two big toes uh, that you can see there, as well as two uh, uh, dew claws there on the back end. And so when it comes to uh, wildlife and, and deer as well, uh, one of the easiest things to do on controlling them as far as keeping them out of your garden uh, landscape uh, is exclusion. Exclusion is the very first thing, uh, very first line of defense. And so in this picture here, you have a, a nice raised garden bed. Um, very neat design. I kind of like it. Um, but uh, you notice all the way around it, they have a, a fence that's, you know, six, maybe eight foot tall uh, with wire netting. And uh, that's something that's tall enough that the deer can't jump over. Here's another one that's kind of the same concept, just, um, you know, a little bit more cost involved with it. Um, and uh, another nice little setup. This is a, uh, this is a garden that's in, uh, I believe it's in Jonesboro. But um, they've done a really nice job of, of uh really decorating their garden up, but also excluding deer. Uh, you can see they got a nice tall barrier um, that has uh, chicken wire on it, so that helps keep out the deer uh, being tall, but also helps keep out uh, um, other animals as well that might come by. Even their gates are real decorative, well, they're real decorative, but they also serve a purpose. Um, they got nice little, those nice metal spikes that can't really deter deer from, from jumping over it there. For a little bit larger area um, that, you, that you might be dealing with, like a pasture, um, here's a situation where they've put in, um, looks like a four foot tall uh, wire fencing, and then uh, about uh, two and a half, three foot above that, they've put in a strand of barbed wire, and that helps deter the uh, deer from jumping over. Very simple design on this one. Uh, it might be kind of hard to see, and I apologize for that. But uh, what they have is they have uh, uh, some small fence posts all the way around this garden. They have uh, they use fishing line, and so something that's uh, very economical to use. Uh, use 20 to 30 pound test line and strung it all the way across this garden. And uh, uh, they have the, the fishing line set at six inches apart and so six inch spacing going all the way up to about seven to eight feet and uh, something that it's small enough a deer can't go through but uh, and you know, I think well it's just fishing line well some research has shown that uh, deer really don't like the sound of, of the wind as it moves through that fishing line kind of makes a high-pitched noise and the deer really don't like it and uh, so something that's very economical very simple to do uh, here's a situation where uh, a producer has a lot of uh, young fruit trees and they've put uh, wire fencing all the way around it. This is a temporary solution. As those trees get a little bit older and bigger, that's not going to work too well because um, they don't have enough space in there. But uh, for, for young trees, um, and uh, deer will go after those young fruit trees, um, this is something that uh, will help for, uh, for a short time. 
Now, depending on your situation, where you live, um, electric, fence, electric fencing might be a, a situation you decide to go with as for, for keeping deer out. Um, now, if you live in the city or, or in Hot Springs Village, um, you're probably not going to be able to use electric fencing. I don't know the ordinances on that, um, so I'd probably check first. Um, also, if you have uh, small children around, kids, grandkids, or, or neighborhood kids that go running through, um, then you probably don't want to use electric fencing in that situation either. But um, uh, for some folks, it might be a, a good solution. And so on the top left, you see somebody that's uh, strained out some uh, uh, some net wire electric fencing. Uh, on, the t on the top right, uh, you see a situation where that electric fencing, it doesn't go up too high. But uh, what they have is two rows that are spaced about two to maybe three foot apart and so it's spaced far enough apart where the deer can't jump over both strands but at the same time they can't jump between the strands as far as you know in the middle of the row either um, and uh, uh, University of Arkansas Extension has done some demonstrations on this uh, not with vegetable gardens but with pastures uh, down at the research station at Hope and it was very very effective now down there on the bottom, I see a little bit different situation where just one uh, strand of electric fencing is run and uh, uh, a very inexpensive thing is used with it, a small piece of foil and some peanut butter. And so, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, deer are very attracted to peanut butter. And uh, so once they smell it, they, they go up there to it and uh, they sniff on it, they might lick it. And when they do that, or if they smell it and they touch that electric fencing, that extra electric line, um, it'll give them a, a little bit of a shock and uh, they won't come back. Um, not unless they're not very smart. Um, so anyway, that's a, that's a simple design use, using just one line of electric fencing. Of course, that would go around a complete perimeter of a garden. Stamp is another way to keep deer out. Um, some very, there are some very simple solutions for uh, scents that uh, deter deer. Um, you can get hair from a salon or a barber shop and uh, kind of sprinkle that around. Uh, a lot of times they, they don't like that smell too much. Irish Spring Soap is another one. Uh, it has a very distinct smell to it, very, very uh, strong smell that deer don't like. And so when looking at uh, design on using that soap, um, here's a, a design where they have used some uh, bird netting and hung that soap in there. Uh, one thing I've done before is just drilled a hole straight through the soap and used a piece of twine and hung it up. Um, if you're trying to use scents to, to keep deer out, um, it's best to kind of combine those scents. So uh, you can go to a, a farm store, um, home, home and garden center, you know, a lot of different places and you can get um, uh, sprays that are used for wildlife deterrence or deer deterrence either way. And uh, you can spray that around. I'd use something else with it, you know, whether it be hair or Irish spring soap. But the thing is, you got to kind of mix it up. And so you might keep it one thing for four to six weeks and kind of change it up a little bit for another four to six weeks. And so you kind of kind of have to uh, keep that going. They will get used to a scent, and then they won't bother them anymore. Uh, here's a, a little device that you can find. I've seen it in stores here locally, and it's a motion-activated uh, sprinkler. Um, it will just, once it detects the motion, whether it be deer or another animal, um, it will uh, shoot out a, a spray of water. And so even if that spray of water doesn't hit the animal, just the sound of it, uh, will startle the animal, um, but you know you probably this is probably something that you want to make sure that you have a um, you know you can probably set it up. I've never used these before. You can probably set it up where it has timers on them, uh, so where it just goes off at night or whatever. Um, but uh, you know if you're going out walking your dog in the middle of the night, you might want to make sure that uh, you have it turned off. Uh, you might get a shower in the middle of the night that way. I don't know. So when dealing with deer, one question I get a bunch is, uh, what can I plant that deer won't eat? 
Well, I, I put a little bit of a fine print there. I always read the fine print. And it says, if deer are hungry enough, no plant is deer resistant. Um, but, uh, I mean, even if they're not hungry, I, I can't 100% guarantee that the deer won't eat this. Um, I've tried to get this list out to, out to deer to make them understand, but uh, I haven't been very successful with that yet. Um, but uh, here's just a, a small list of things that you can plant um, in your flower beds. Um, or in your landscape, uh, things like boxwood, uh, forsythia, um, holly, juniper, and so a lot of different things. There. There's even things like thyme. Thyme has a very strong scent that, that they don't like. Um, and this is just a small list. You know, I can get you a bigger list if, if, if need be. Um, it's also accessible on our website through uh, uaex.edu. I'll share that with you at the end. Next thing is uh, some raccoons, uh, cute little furry creatures. Um, there's the tracks on them. They have a, a pretty distinctive foot. Um, electric fencing can be used on raccoons. Of course, you're going to keep that a little bit lower to the ground, uh, about two inches high for the first one, then uh, two more at six inches higher each step. Raccoons are uh, very opportunistic feeders. They will eat most any type of food, um, bird seed included. One thing a lot of people do is they put little uh, baffles, kind of like what you see in the uh, uh, right side picture there. Because raccoons, their, their hands, they can grab onto stuff pretty well. And they can climb. Um, and so... You know, a lot of people put baffles on there and uh, kind of keep be able to climb up and around it. But uh, as I said, raccoons, they're, they're pretty ingenious creatures. And so it's not always the not always the best thing. To uh, keep uh, raccoons out, uh, you can use some scents, uh, one that. Uh, is, is fairly effective is a one-to-one -one mixture of black pepper and ground cinnamon and you kind of sprinkle it around your garden. Um, those, uh, they say the spices irritates the raccoon sense of smell and they'll stay away. Uh, now just make sure if, um, if it rains, make sure you go through there and sprinkle it again because uh, it, obviously it will wash away. Live traps are something you can use for uh, raccoons and uh, other small animals. Um, for raccoons, uh, as far as uh, what you have here, you see as a as a box trap. It's a, it's a type of live trap. Um, it's called a live trap because uh, it it keeps the animal alive, um, and so you'll have to to move the animal somewhere else. But uh, first thing, your first concern is, is just catching the animal itself. You can find uh, box traps at uh, different farm stores around the area. Um, and uh, uh, they're, they're fairly economical and, and they are reusable. Uh, in order to uh, try to catch rat raccoons, uh, you can bait the trap with dry cat food that has uh, uh, some fish meal in it. Uh, that will that will attract them. Um, if you go three or four nights and you haven't been successful yet, um, you might look at switching to uh, chicken necks, uh, an ear of sweet corn, or whole peanuts, um, and then and then so kind of switch it up a little bit if you're not successful. Now, as I said, it's, it is a live trap, and so uh, if you go to uh, 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 when you catch the animal, you will have to release it. Um, you want to go several miles away and that, make sure you have several roads or highways in between your house and uh, and uh, where you're releasing the animal at. And so don't so don't just go to the neighbor's yard that you don't like and, and dump it off there because that raccoon will come right back to your house. Now, one thing with live traps, um, you do have to keep watch over them. As far as uh, if you set one up one night, make sure you go and check it in the morning. Um, don't leave these out for several days. Um, you can catch your own pet or your neighbor's pet um, in these traps. All 
possums, uh, little furry creatures, um, they, they like to get in their gardens. And uh, the, just like raccoons, they'll eat a lot of different things. They'll eat vegetables. They'll eat animal material, um, earthworms. They'll eat all kinds of things. Uh, but and, but they, they, I have seen them do a lot of damage in vegetable gardens. They kind of have an odd shaped uh, track as well. So they're kind of easy to, if you see the tracks, they're kind of easy to figure out. As far as repellents, um, there are a couple of things you can do. Um, you can mix uh, two tablespoons of crushed garlic um, or hot chilies into uh, a liter of boiling water. Uh, once it's cooled off, uh, pour that in a spray uh, spray bottle. You can kind of squirt it on your plants and around your garden. There are a couple other things there. Tabasco sauce can be painted as, on, on wood as an additional deterrent. And uh, then the last thing down there at the bottom, uh, it has a, a type of tea, and I'm not going to try to pronounce it. I think it's an Asian type of tea that you can find um, at some of the Asian stores around. Groundhogs. Um, this is an animal that's uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, I, I've grown up around hot springs. I've lived here nearly my whole life and never really seen groundhogs until about the last two, maybe three years. Um, they're kind of neat looking animals. And um, I've heard I've got a few calls on groundhogs getting into gardens and the landscapes. Um, they will go in there and eat your vegetables and tomatoes. Uh, they'll, they'll have a feast on those. Of course, uh, there on the uh, top left are the uh, the tracks of, of groundhogs. Whenever I think of groundhogs, I always think of, uh, of the movie Groundhog Day with, with Bill Murray. Uh, pretty funny movie. Bill Murray's one of my favorite actors. And uh, you can use uh, box traps on uh, groundhogs as well. Um, use apple slices, carrots, uh, sweet corn are some things you can bait the trap with this. If you found where the groundhog is burrowing at, you can actually set that, uh, the opening of that box trap right in front of its burrow and uh, makes it real desirable for it. But just like uh, same with possums and, and uh, raccoons, you know, when you go to release it, make sure you release it several, uh, several miles away. If I had the perfect method to keep out squirrels uh, out of the garden, landscape, attics, um, I wouldn't be here today. I'd be rich and retired, uh, just be 100% honest with you. Um, these are probably the toughest animals to deal with. Um, there's not really any 100% guaranteed way to um, keep these animals out of your garden uh, and flower bed. They like to chew. Uh, they don't chew to try to get access to something. Um, they might be, you know, they, they chew on, on houses. They'll, they, you see here, they chew on birdhouses. Um, that could be a problem because they'll go in there to the birdhouses and, and they'll make a nest uh, to get in there. As I said, they don't chew for access, but if they chew a hole big enough where they can get in, they will use it for access. Um, they chew to kind of keep their teeth gnawed down. Uh, they're kind of like gophers and and uh, beavers, they have to chew to gnaw their teeth down pretty good. But anyway, here's a simple solution for uh, uh, for keeping out squirrels. It's, that's just a little metal uh, thing that goes around the door of a birdhouse. You can live trap squirrels. Uh, you probably want to use a smaller trap than you would for raccoons. Um, you can bait these with corn, peanut butter, nuts, oranges, apples, um, several things there. Uh, some repellents that you can use for tree, tree squirrels. Uh, you can buy some uh, 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 some store-bought uh, items. One's called Ropel. Uh, another one is Capsaicin. Um, you can buy in the store as well as mothballs uh, will help uh, deter them. Armadillos. Um, armadillos will do some damage. This is a picture I took about a year ago um, at a uh, home here locally, uh, I think out, out uh, towards Lake Hampton School. And uh, they did some pretty heavy damage to, uh, to this individual's yard and, and to neighbor's yards.
but one thing they like to eat is they like to eat grub worms and earthworms is what they're going after. Um, you can live trap. Uh, box trap armadillos. Um, they can't see and smell very well. And so you kind of have to use a funnel almost. You kind of have to funnel them in to that box trap because they'll bump their nose. Like you can see here, they use a little bit of uh, some orange construction fencing. They'll bump their nose and then they'll just keep on following it along, either along that fence or on the, uh, on the side of the building there. And so you kind of funnel them into that box trap. Skunks, uh, kind of interesting little animal. Um, something you can see, you'll see every once in a while. Um, they'll get in your garden, they'll get in your flower bed. Uh, they can cause uh, some issues. You can uh, use a box trap on these. I probably wouldn't use a box trap like the one in the top left because um, once you go to pick it up, um, it will uh, very, very good chance it's going to spray you and uh, make you smell kind of funny. Um, and so uh, you can buy box traps like the one in the in the uh, bottom picture there where it's completely enclosed. Also, you could use uh, some thick burlap or some plastic tarp to put over it as well before you catch the, the skunk. And so that way it can't spray you uh, when you go to move the trap. Moles, you can't really live trap moles. Um, there are some mold, there are traps that you can buy, but it will kill the mole. Um, there's not, I don't think, I don't know of any way to really uh, uh, effectively uh, live trap them, but there are several uh, traps out on the market. And as I said, it will kill the mole, so it'll, it will, it'll take care of the problem. Uh, repellents um, aren't really useful. Um, a lot of times those are made with uh, grain or other plant material. And moles don't eat that. Moles eat earthworms. Uh, you can't use po poisons or toxins. Those are illegal. Um, I know they make little poison earthworm looking structures that you can get from moles. Um, but the problem is, um, is off target species. And so let's say a mole eats one of them. It gets poisoned. And then uh, your cat comes through and finds that mole and eats it. Well, then your, your cat could be poisoned um, or a dog or whatever it might be. Uh, gophers are another one that uh, like to burrow in the ground like uh, like moles. Um, there is no really good way to live trap these. Um, there are traps available, but as I said, it, it will kill the mole. Um, once again, poison baits um, are illegal. Fumigates are illegal. There are repellents out there, but they haven't been studied enough to really uh, see how well they do. Um, a lot of people say uh, castor beans, you know, that's... Uh, they don't eat grains and things like that. And so it's not anything that's that they're really going to, it's not going to bother them too much. There's another little Bill Murray appearance there. Another, another great Bill Murray movie, movie uh, Caddyshack. Uh, cottontail rabbits. I don't really, I haven't really got any calls on these, but I do see them around quite a bit. Um, exclusions, your best bet here. Um, two foot high chicken wire. That's buried a little bit because obviously rabbits will burrow in the ground. Um, if you're having a problem with them getting on your trees um, or, or chewing on your trees, uh, you can use some hardware cloth that's about 20 inches uh, wide and uh, kind of wrap around it. Um, they do like to have a lot of cover. And so if you have some areas in your yard where, where they're hiding out at um, and they're causing a problem for you, then uh, make sure you take care of that brush or that cover that, that, that's there. Uh, word of caution when doing it yourself, uh, make sure, uh, you know, any type of control method, check on the legality first. Um, electric fencing is illegal in, in some communities. Uh, same thing, discharging a firearm um, is illegal in some, in some communities as well. You can't do that in the Hot Springs Village. You can't do that in the city of Hot Springs. Um, and so those aren't uh, really approved methods of, uh, of taking care of nuisance wildlife. Um, hunting and trapping is legal for uh, some wildlife species, uh, but sometimes some of these species can have uh, um, certain seasons where you can trap and you can't trap. And uh, But uh, Game and Fish says if they are a nuisance and they are on that list that I showed earlier, uh, then you can take care of them anytime. And so just make sure you know what you're going after first. And there's my information there. As I said, my name is Alex Dykes, and uh, 
Uh, my position is a uh, horticulture uh, county extension agent here in Garland County. Um, I'd like for you to come by and uh, visit if you have any questions, um, or you can call me at 623-6841, uh, or, uh, or email is another way there. And so a lot of different ways to get a hold of me. I'm here to help out the community, help out the uh, help out the citizens here. And uh, so if you have any questions as far as horticulture, I can help you out. Um, if you have questions on uh, other things with agriculture, I, I can help you out or our other agriculture agent, Jimmy Driggers, can help you. Um, and we also have an agent for uh, family consumer sciences, another agent that specializes just with horticulture. So we can answer a lot of questions here in this office. And so we're here for you. And that's that's the end of what I have. And so I, I, know, I believe there's time. I believe I have some time for questions. All right. Thank you, Alex. Can you hear me okay? I got you. All right. Well, uh, once again, thank you for that. And uh, I uh, have an announcement to make on our winners of the door prizes that the Master Gardeners are providing. Uh, we have Cindy, Karishma, and Peggy. You three are going to have uh, prizes available for pickup at the Garland County Library. The Master Gardeners are going to drop those off for you. So congratulations. Um, and uh, last call for questions or comments, if uh, anybody has anything or any concerns they'd like uh, me to ask Alex here. Um, so first of all, um, what animal would you say out of everything you talked about is the number one nuisance here in Garland County? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, deer is, a, is one I get uh, homeowners calling on a, a lot. Um, but uh, uh, we, we, we deal a lot with deer, but uh, I would say it's probably squirrels. I'm just going to be 100% honest with you. I think squirrels, as I, said, as I said earlier, there's no really perfect solution to get rid of. You know, not, I, get rid of is not, probably not the correct term, but uh, as far as, you know, uh, controlling them, you know, getting in our gardens, landscapes, um, houses, um, all kinds of things. Yeah, and uh, that was another question I was going to ask you, but you answered it during your presentation. What's the hardest animal to deal with? Uh, and for so many reasons, you, you said why, why squirrels are so hard to deal with. Ooh, are there any other ones in particular that are a challenge? Um, you know, really, that's the biggest one. I said de squirrels and deer are probably the hardest ones to really deal with. Um, but, you know, just you know, like the other ones I mentioned, you know, talk about raccoons, you know, well, they'll damage our gardens and, you know, and, and uh, a little bit, um, and, and possums, we get problems with possums. Um, you know, what they, a lot of people will do, you know, in the summertime, you know, we're getting people that's growing, you know, tomatoes and, and, uh, and peppers and all kinds of things. And they'll see damage on the, on the, uh, uh, on the on the vegetable or the fruit, um, but they can't figure out what it is. And so, you know, a lot of people will, will take a picture of it and send it to me, or they'll bring the uh, the actual um, item in. You know, whether it be like a tomato or something. And a lot of times, we can tell what the what the issue, you know, what animal they're dealing with, just based on the teeth marks. Got a couple questions from email earlier. Uh, what plants do deer prefer? You know. Uh, a lot of times people like to plant some of these different uh, plants to encourage deer to come in. And sometimes people want to, you know, sometimes people want to know not what not to plant to prevent damage. Um, and so, you know, depending on what you're looking at, um, either way, but some things that they really like to eat, um, hostas, daylilies, and roses are, are the biggest thing. Um, you know, you think your roses is kind of an odd one because um, it's thorny and you'd think, but they don't want to eat that. They love roses. They love hostas, you know, it's, because it's got really a lot of green uh, foliage on it. They really like those daylilies I mentioned. Uh, but some other things, azaleas, uh, Indian hawthorn, uh, fruit plants, um, blueberries, blackberries, you know, some things like that they like to eat on. Um, uh, tulips is another one. You know they'll they'll go through and they'll eat the uh, they'll eat the blossoms off the tulips. Is there a type of plant or crop or flower that's the hardest to protect? You'd say. Um. You know it just depends on on what you know what your setup is and um, you know 
tulips a lot of times people like to have those out and show you know where people can see them you know in the springtime they're you know they're showy plants or they're beautiful to look at um those can be pretty tough um but of course that's just a short time um that that, that we really see those around um berry plants um blue, blueberries blackberries um they really really like them and they'll they'll, they'll not only eat the fruit but they'll eat the the leaves they'll eat the uh, the stems or the uh, uh the limbs i should say um and those can be pretty difficult because a lot of times you know, especially if you don't prune them back pretty good, you know, they'll, blueberries and blackberry plants can really get big and, and, uh, and, uh, and spread out quite a bit. And so it makes it hard to exclude, keep deer out of there. Um, you know, if, unless you just have a, like I showed in the, in the presentation, some really good fencing around there. <clears throat> Another question from email. Uh, how do I keep, uh, get squirrels out of an attic? We get that question a lot. Um, Squirrels, as I said, they, they won't chew for access to something. But if they chew a hole big enough where they can get in, they'll use it. They'll nest in it. Um, they can really cause some problems. They can, you know, once they're, once they're inside, um, they can cause problems. They can chew on um, uh, electrical cable, electrical wiring. And, uh, of course, at that point, then it becomes a fire hazard. And, uh, and so, you know, it's it's a serious safety issue if they get inside a in, inside a structure, whether it be a house or a storage building, whatever it might be. Um, and so, if you have issue with squirrels getting in, um, some things that you can do. Uh, number one is, is is exclusion. You you've got to exclude them. And but if you already have them inside, um, what you want to do is you actually want to cut out. You know, take out. Um, uh, or I should say close off. It's the best, probably a better term. Close off all the exits and entrances they're using. And so uh, look around real well for that. Close them off using some hardware cloth, um, something like, you know, something something hard where they're not going to be able to chew through. Um, close them all off except for one exit. You want to leave one exit so that way any squirrels that are inside can get out. Um install a one-way door and so this can be a simple thing like uh, just a, you know a piece of hardware cloth where it's going to open up for them to get out but then once they're out then that door will close up and they can't get back in um, but there's also some traps that you can get um, where when they go out that hole you have that trap set up right there so it's kind of sitting there and then they're kind of stuck in there once they get in there then you can release them um, just like you would with any other live trap um, you can also put traps in the attic, uh, as well as using a, a one-way door or, or a live trap like that, but you can put live traps inside, I say the attic, cause you know, that's something that, uh, um, that we see a lot with, but, uh, or any other type of structure, have some live traps in there. You've closed off all the exits, bait those traps with water, put some, put some little, you know, cat food or tuna fish cans with water in them, because if they're not able to get out, then they're going to want water more than they're going to want food. And so it's a very, that's actually a very easy way to trap them and then uh, release them far away. As I said, don't, don't just dump them outside. Don't put them, you know, next door, you know, go several miles away where they have several roads, highways that they'd have to cross to get all the way back. You know, squirrels are going to remember what, you know, how to get inside a structure once they figure out a way to get in. So you want to get, get them far away. Um, <clears throat> speaking of squirrels, uh, we got a live question from Karishma. Um, how do I keep squirrels from eating my plants, especially the potted ones? Okay. Um, one thing you might try is, uh, there are, uh, some, uh, some deterrents you can buy, um, at, at home and garden stores, um, such as Lowe's or, uh, Garland County Farmers Co-op, different things like that. But you can buy some deterrents that are designed for spraying on, um, whether it be flower bulbs or directly on the plant itself. And so uh, that's probably going to be your best bet, um, as long as it's an ornamental. Now, if it's a vegetable plant, you probably don't want to spray that directly on on the uh, tomatoes or, or peppers or whatever you're dealing with they're attacking because um, they cause an off flavor for yourself um, but ornamentals that there are a lot of sprays that you can put uh, put on that and as I said they're real bad about digging up fire bulbs and so there are chemicals uh, deterrents that you can use to dip those bulbs in 
<clears throat> and Karishma says, thank you. I, I wish I could really do something to keep those little tree squirrels away. I, I wish I could too. <laughs> you, you're talking about uh, what kind of flowers that deer like earlier. And mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm going to spell the name of this flower because uh, I have a lack of knowledge on this. <laughs> G-L-A-D-I-O-L-U-S. Say it again. G-L-A-D-I-O-L-U-S. Oh, gladiolas. Okay. Gladiolas. Okay. Okay. I, I've heard. I, I could have guessed it. All right. Well, Peggy says deer really like gladiolas. Yeah, I don't. I don't have that on the list. Um, but uh, I, I imagine that that's something they would they would like. Especially um, on the blooms and everything too. Uh, uh, sorry, did, did I just cut up? Uh, what one animal uh, I didn't hear you talk about. Uh, was bats. Do you have anything to say about those? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we do get, you know, a lot of calls on bats, especially it seems like in the, in the fall, a lot of times we get a lot of calls on bats. Um, bats will be, a lot of times will be on the move. They are, you know, the, they are kind of a migratory animal. Um, a lot of times you'll get a bat, you know, you'll get a, uh, I don't know the correct term is a, a flock of bats. I don't know, but um, you'll get a bit, you know, big old mess of them and they'll be in a, They'll find the entry into a storage a storage building or an attic. Um, I, we, I got several calls back in the fall on this. And so, um, as I said, they're kind of migratory. So sometimes they might be there for a couple of weeks and they'll leave. Um, but uh, if, they, if they make a home of it, um, it can be a problem because their mess can really, uh, I think um, histoplasmosis, I think, is possible to get from their manure. Um, but I'm not exactly positive on that. There's something. Uh, but anyway. As far as uh, keeping them out, um, you've got to just like with the squirrels, if you find the entry point, and it, it, they, I mean, they need a very small entry point, um, and, and install a one-way door. So that way, in the evening time when they fly out, they're going to be able to come out of that one-way door, but it's going to close back and they can't get back in. Uh, and so that's a very simple thing. Um, if somebody is wanting some of those design uh, design for that, I can. Uh, I, I'm I'm more than happy to uh, share those with with uh, anybody. Um, th that's a simple thing to do. Um, another one I heard back in the uh, uh, back in the fall was they were getting under a carport, and um, and so of course there's really no way to really close it off. And so one thing I suggested was. Uh, putting some uh, some floor lights or some shop lights where it's shining up there, um, and the and leaving on all night, and then they're not going to want to come in there too much. And I think that's that's another possible solution. All right. So uh, f final question here. Um, in, in your line of work, you've probably dealt with a, a lot of interesting situations and have some interesting stories to to share. I'm going to put you on the spot here and let you. Pick a story or two, um, and, and I'll give you a minute to think about that uh, while I uh, make a couple of announcements here. Um, Judy may have mentioned this earlier. The next Master Gardeners program is going to be February 25th, uh, pruning trees in your landscape with crepe myrtles. With uh, Alan Bates is returning by popular demand. And uh, this Thursday night, if anyone's interested in art uh, that's uh, important here in Hot Springs. We have, we're uh, having an interview with the muralist Pepe Gaka. You might rep uh, recognize some of his artwork from around Hot Springs there. All right, Alex, did you think of anything? Uh, you know, not anything off, really offhand. Um, you know, I, I, well, I do th I think of a um, situation that happened uh, a year, year and a half ago. Um, and it was a pest control company here in town. And they kept on having an issue with some creature. And they couldn't figure out what it was. Um, the homeowner kept on seeing, you know, different things left behind by it. But they couldn't ever figure out what it was. And uh, all they could come up with were, you know, some uh, little tiny pieces. That it almost looked like, you know, I saw it. I thought it was scat. Um you know, it was hard to tell. Um, some, you know, pest control company at first thought it might be some type of egg, ca egg casing or something. And that's all we had to go by was just whatever this little thing was. And it really puzzled us for 
a while. Um, I think this went on for a few weeks. We're trying. I was working with one of the uh, specialists um, in Little Rock, one of the extension specialists that deals with wildlife issues. And um, after a lot of research and going back and forth and asking all kinds of people, ended up being some type of um, uh, some type of shrew. And uh, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. And that's, all, you know, that we never even saw the animal. And I can't even remember offhand what they did to, to uh, get rid of it. But you know, they figured out what to do and, and got it taken care of. And uh, uh, so that's been one thing. You know, a lot of times we'll get um, uh, folks that, that come up here and, you know, and they'll have stuff on their uh you know, game camera, and they're like, oh, what is this animal? And so, you know, a lot of times you might not have more than just a, a nose or an ear or something, and uh, so that makes it kind of interesting. But, uh, you know what, I come across stuff all the time, and, and uh, you know, a lot of it is kind of a challenge to kind of figure out what's going on, you know, a lot, whether it be, a, as I said, I deal mainly with plants, and so whether it be a plant disease or, you know, uh, you know, what's, you know, things like that, it's, there's it's something every day. And so it's, it's pretty interesting though. No chupacabras yet. No, not yet. Not yet. Uh, all right. Well, uh, let everyone know uh, one more time where they can find you. If they have any questions, uh, what, what might be some good resources and anything else you'd like to say? Okay. Yeah. Um, as I said, uh, I'm here at the Garland County Extension Office, and uh, we're right here near the courthouse at uh, 236 Woodbine. Uh, it's the corner of Hazel and Woodbine. If you've been around Hot Springs for a long time, um, a lot of people know it as the old pediatric clinic. And uh, so we're down the street, what I call from what I call the old library. Um, but anyway, it's part of the courthouse system now. But, um, but anyway, that's kind of where we're at. Um, you know, of course, we, we got all the COVID guidelines and everything, but our office is open um, 8 to 4.30, Monday through Friday. Uh, we're here to help you out. Um, if you have a question on, you know, anything agriculture, family, consumer science related, things like that, it may or somebody else here in the office can help you out and uh, and, and and love to do it. And so uh, we've got all kinds of resources to help you out and, uh, and work with you. I've even gone on several house visits. I do, you know, seems like two or three of those a week and uh, going out and looking at different things. All right. Well, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for the program. And thank you, everyone, for watching. And have a good evening. Thank you, Paul.